So welcome everyone to today's lecture on Jewish philosophy. Before I introduce our speaker, let me say just a few words about the idea of this lecture series and about some practicalities. My name is Alice Pinheiro-Walla and I'm a professor at the University of Bayreuth here in Germany. Um, the idea of this lecture series uh, emerged within the context of my teaching on Jewish philosophy at the University of Bayreuth. So this is something that is new at this university. And we wanted to open this space so that we could have speakers as diverse as possible to enrich our horizons and also to make um, Jewish philosophy more known at our side. Um, so please mute yourselves during the lecture. As a courtesy to Joel, please leave your cameras on um, if you can, uh, so that she's not looking into a black box while she is speaking. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the lecture and I will moderate the discussion so I will let you know how to proceed. I would also like to remind everyone that we are here to learn from, from each other and from the speaker so let's make sure we cultivate a graceful and respectful discussion culture. It is my pleasure to welcome today Dr. Joelle Hansen. She is the program director at the Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. She is a former student of the École Normale Supérieure de Fontenay aux Roses. She is a founding member of the Société Internationale de Recherche Emmanuel Levinas in Paris and of the North American Levinas Society. Dr. Hensel is a specialist in the intellectual history of Italian Judaism in the 17th and 18th centuries. And on this area, she has published Kabbalah and Philosophy in the works of Moses Chaim Luzzato. Uh, with Serf in 2004. She is also a specialist in contemporary French philosophy, especially in the work of Emmanuel Levinas and Jan Jankelevich. And on this area, she has published Vladimir Jankelevich in Philosophie du Charme in 2012. So we have here a very accomplished um, specialist in Jewish philosophy and on Levinas' work. Joel, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak in the series. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, Alice, for uh, your kind uh, introduction. Uh, I just want to say that uh, also my, I belong, I do belong to uh, Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. I'm living in Jerusalem. And so uh, I take you for a trip there <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, the Levinas I would like to talk about today is not uh, the thinker who is recognized as one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, whose works has been translated into more than 20 different languages and are studied in universities throughout the world. My talk is about Levinas, the young and promising philosopher who was still not well known and was at the very beginning of his itinerary, Levinas before the war. I'm just going to ask you to momentarily forget the picture of the venerable white-haired philosopher. I would like you to replace this image with that of the young Levinas in the 1930s when he had, as he proudly recalled, half a century later, an abundance of very dark, dark hair. I, was, I would also like you to momentarily forget the ethical metaphysics we are familiar with. In Levinas' pre-war writings, there was no question of ethics of the other, of responsibility towards the other, or of the face of the other. On the contrary, Levinas described a solitary subject. For him, freedom and not responsibility was the fundamental aspiration of the individual and even the foundation of 
European civilization and of the humanity of man. It is therefore to this early period in Levinas's philosophical itinerary that we will turn our attention. I will start by a brief account of his life and work in the period before the war. Then I'll focus on Levinas' philosophy of escape, the philosophy set out in 1935 in On Escape, in French, De l'Evasion, his first philosophical essay, and on his reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, the title of his 1934 article, which I used to designate all his writings on Hitlerism published from 1933 and Hitler's seizure of power to 1939, a few months before the war. On Escape and the reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism have two common denominators. The first one is the fundamental problem that Levinas was confronted with through his childhood pre-philosophical experiences, meaning non-philosophical experiences which paved the way for his entry into the world of philosophy. The study of the Bible and the reading of the Russian classics, particularly Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Pushkin, provided him with the problem of humanity of man. What makes a human being really human? How can this humanity be defended against the forces and violence which threaten to annihilate it? From 1933 onwards, the emergence of Hitlerism gave an unparalleled gravity to these questions. The second common denominator is the recurrence of expressions like being chained or being riveted, riveted in on escape, as well as in the reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism. The expression to be riveted inevitably brings to mind the image of the convict who is so tightly bound in irons that even his most basic freedom, freedom of movement, is abolished. Also, he aspires only to escape, and convicts do something break free from their chains and escape. Success is by no means assured. To be riveted to oneself, to be riveted to the body by a racism which also rivets the Jew to his Judaity. This is how Levinas described in his text published shortly after Hitler's access to power, the apparently irremissible chaining from which it is a question of freeing oneself and of escaping. I will therefore recall some aspects of Levinas' life and philosophical activity in the period before the war. Arriving in France in 1923 from his native Lithuania, from the city of Kaunas, Kovno, where he was born in 1906, Levinas, who was only 17 years at the time, began his philosophy studies at the University of Strasbourg in France, alongside Maurice Blanchot, a major, at this time he was not yet, but he will become a major French thinker and writer and his lifelong friend. Through contact with his professors who supported Captain Alfred Dreyfus at the time of the famous and infamous affair, he became deeply immersed in the philosophy of Bergson. He discovered phenomenology, and in 1928, he went to the University of Heiburg, where he attended the classes of Husserl and Heidegger. He published phenomenological studies, which played a decisive role in the reception of the work of these two major philosophers in France. A prestigious prize was awarded to his doctoral thesis, entitled Theory of Intuition in Husserl's Phenomenology, which appeared in 1930. Young Levinas translated, together with Gabriel Payford, 
a young fem female student, Husserl's Cartesian Meditations, which appeared in 1931, 20 years before the original German text was published. In 1927, Levinas was dazzled by the reading of Heidegger's masterwork, Being and Time. In 1932, he published a study entitled Martin Heidegger and Ontology. His analysis of this doctrine, little known in France at the time, still has value as a model, even in the eyes of Heideggerians who do not much appreciate, and this is an understatement, his ethical philosophy. In 1932, Levinas enjoyed a reputation as a brilliant and promising young philosopher. He mastered perfectly this phenomenological text that many of his French contemporaries had only just discovered. Jean-Paul Sartre said that he came to phenomenology through Levinas and Simone de Beauvoir also testified. 1932 was also the year he married Raisa Levy, a virtuoso pianist who was his next door neighbor in Kovno. Therefore, Levinas was, as the old Yiddish saying goes, happy as God in France. It was then that the tragic events that would change the course of his life occurred. In 1932, Levinas learned from his friend, the philosopher Alexandre Coiré, the news of Heidegger Hitlerian sympathies. A few months later, Hitler came to power. Under the pressure of events, Levinas published in 1933, the understanding of spirituality in French and German culture, culture is only article written in Lithuanian. And uh, because I, I saw that my friend Andrews, uh, Professor Andrews Golevicius is uh, present with us. So I must say that uh, he, he had the great uh, merit to, uh, first of all, to find the article, this article, which is very precious, completely by chance. Uh, I, if I remember well, when he was in uh, the library of, at the uh, University of Vilna, and he translated it from Lithuanian to English. And also, as we were very, uh, were, were very grateful to him uh, because uh, we, he, he also uh, sent us uh, the Lithuanian original and uh, we could translate it into French. Okay, so this is for 1933, and in 1934, uh, reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism. In 1935, Levinas, now a critic of Heidegger, set out for the first time his personal philosophical thinking in On Escape. The articles is published between 1935 and 1939, shows that racism is at the origin of an antisemitism that irreversibly, irreversibly chains or rivets the Jew to his Jewishness. Levinas also highlighted the other side of Hitlerism, namely neo-paganism. In 1940, on the eve of his mobilization in the French army and on the threshold of his five years of captivity in Germany as a prisoner of war, Levinas again published phenomenological studies in which the central concepts of his philosophy, the other and the otherness appeared for the first time. So when talking about his pre-war writings, more than half a century later, Levinas stressed the weight or the heaviness of history, which in those years was marked by, quote, the presentiment of Hitlerism everywhere, the approaching anxieties of war, the whole fatigue of being, the qualms of the period and its frame of mind, unquote. Thus, there is a tight connection between all the writings that Levinas published after 1933 between Levinas's philosophical writings, mainly on escape, 
and those where one can sense the brutal eruption of history. This close connection emerged explicitly from a book review that Levinas dedicated in 1934 to La Présence Totale, yeah, Total Presence, by Louis Lavelle, a prominent French philosopher in the 1930s. There, Levinas drew a parallel between the weight of history and the weight of existence, a theme which became one year later at the core of his philosophy of escape. That's what he wrote at the beginning of his review, quote, the war, the first world won, and the dark presentiments that preceded it as well as the crisis that followed it have together left human beings with a feeling of an existence that sovereign and imperturbable reason could never exhaust nor satisfy. A generation that is tragically conscious of the pregnant flavor of a life restricted to the limits of time cannot ignore the weight or the gravity of this existence. The self found itself compelled to come to terms with being, to bring into light the link that attached himself to it." Unquote. Coming to terms with the weight and the gravity of existence, bringing into light the link that attached us to it. That's exactly the task that Levinas assigned to himself in 1935 in On Escape. There, he described the situation of the self who is chained or riveted to an existence that has become a burden and the need for escape it, it arouses. In order to shed light on the chaining of the self and his need for escape, Levinas analyzed corporal phenomena, suffering, need, pleasure, uneasiness, shame, and nausea. nausea. He showed how this phenomena brings the self who experiences them inexorably back to himself so that he is enclosed in himself, chained and riveted to himself. This is what each one of us can experience in pain. As Levinas stressed, not moral pain, but physical pain, especially when it reaches its peak. As Levinas wrote, it is the situation of, quote, the sick man who turns over in his bed of suffering to find a position that gives him peace. The self who is riveted to his bed is in fact riveted to himself. I now turn to need, to which Levinas gave an unusual meaning. When defined according to the feelings of the person who feels it, need appears as a lack or a deprivation and therefore as an aspiration to satisfaction. For Levinas, quote, all this psychology of need is a little short, unquote. Need is not for satisfaction and therefore, quote, for an object capable of providing it, unquote. It does not, quote, turn turn us towards something other than us. It is not an insufficiency of our being pushed to seek refuge in something other than itself." Unquote. Need therefore does not make us leave ourselves. On the contrary, it brings us back to ourselves. Therefore, need is a concretization of the movement of reflection by which the self finds itself and close within itself. By contrast to suffering and need, pleasure seems to be, quote, a promise of escape, unquote, and of a departure from oneself. In pleasure, the, be the being is lightened of that heaviness from which satisfaction of need could not rid us. Pleasure is, quote, an abandonment a loss of oneself, an exit outside oneself, an ecstasy, unquote. It consists of a movement 
quote, which does not tend towards a goal because he had no end, unquote. Yet it is when pleasure is at its peak that the promise of escape proves deceptive. Hmm. Pleasure, quote, is broken after the, su the supreme break where the human being believed in complete ecstasy but was completely disappointed and ashamed to find himself again existing." Unquote. Shame is a phenomenon whose analysis follows immediately that of pleasure. Here again, Levinas started from the explanation that can be given if one considers shame from a psychological or sociological point of view. By defining it as a shame in front of others, as Sartre will do in being a nothing mess, shame is given a moral and social character. By contrast, for Levinas, shame is not shame in front of the others. It is shame of myself in front of myself. It is the unbearable presence of the shell of the self ashamed of himself. As Simone Ancel, his daughter said, Levinas was a big fan of Charlie Chaplin. And I hope very much that the youngest uh, uh, among us uh, do uh, know and do uh, see uh, Charlie Chaplin movies. It was in one of, of his movies that he found the example of a situation where our being becomes unbearable to us, quote, the whistle that Charlie Chaplin swallows in city lights triggers the scandal of the brutal presence of his being. It works like a recording device which betrays the discreet manifestation of a presence that Charlie's legendary tramp costume barely dissimulates." Unquote. From shame, Levinas moves on to nausea of which he gave a very realistic description. Quote, the, set, the state of nausea that precedes vomiting and from which vomiting will deliver us and closes us on all sides. While revolted from the inside, our deaths smother beneath ourselves. Our inwards heave. In French, nous avons mal au coeur. Unquote. The, enclo the enclosure in oneself that takes place in nausea is radical. Nausea touches, quote, the most intimate part of our being and lifts us from within, unquote. For Levinas, the effort to get out of nausea is desperate. The past that affective phenomena, notably pleasure, seemed to open up prove impracticable. To be riveted seems irremissible. How then to make the project of escape succeed? Even if Levinas gave an answer to these questions at the end of, at the end of On Escape, he was content to point out, quote, a new way, unquote, that would allow one to escape, but without explaining in what it consists. I turn now to Levinas's reflections of what he characterized as the philosophy of Hitlerism and to his articles published between 1934 and 1939. These articles are notably different from the purely philosophical writings on Husserl and Heidegger that Levinas published before 1933. As he wrote in 1938, quote, can one still philosophize when faced with a danger that threatens directly your being, a danger that is aimed at you directly, that speaks to you as it were in the second person singular? There are times when philosophy is an indecency." Unquote. Nevertheless, Levinas was and remained a philosopher. At the risk of astonishing, of shocking, he had no hesitation in referring 
to a philosophy of Hitlerism. In reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, Levinas showed an extraordinary lucidity at the time, 1934, just one year after Hitler became chancellor, when many intellectuals had still illusions about the true nature of Hitlerism. To him, Hitlerism was not a passing phenomenon, a simple accident in the course of history or a feat of madness. It was not limited to the realm of politics. It was not only a struggle between two regimes, democracy and, and dictatorship. It was not reduced to an irrational phenomenon, to a sudden outburst of violence. That's what Levinas meant when he stated that, quote, elementary emotions harbor a philosophy. They express the prime attitude of a soul when faced with a composite of reality and one's own destiny, unquote. The use of the word soul indicates that the Levinasian discourse is being deployed in the realm of culture and spiritual life. This was already the case in his 1933 article, The Understanding of Spirituality in French and German Culture. There, Levinas defined two forms of spirituality. French spirituality is based on a radical dualism that makes mind and body foreign to each other and on scorn for everything related to biological life, psycholo psychological life and the senses. In contrast, German culture has a strictly monist orientation. It valorizes the concrete and dramatic elements of existence. It confers a spiritual importance on psychological givens. Levinas illustrated his arguments by subtle analysis of French and German philosophy and literature and of psychoanalysis. He criticized the perversions that threatened German spirituality by pointing to the troubling affinity of, quote, the extremist political parties currently so powerful in Germany, I guess you and that is defined uh, who is speaking about, end quote, for the philosophy of Heidegger. He denounced the fascination of the Germans for, quote, the terrible cry of existence, for the mystical voice, end quote, that can be heard in the death of their soul. Levinas's article ends with a masterful interpretation of The Magic Mountain, the novel that Thomas Mann published in 1924 and which Levinas considered as, quote, the living incarnation of the spirit animating German culture, unquote. The plot of The Magic Mountain takes place in Davos in a sanatorium where patients suffer from tuberculosis. To Levinas, the sickness and death that plague the atmosphere of the Davos sanatorium testify to, quote, an inner life closely linked to the body, unquote. Affected by the miasma of tuberculosis, love, quote, allows one to touch the bottom of existence, unquote. Life in the biological sense, death, to which most tuberculosis patients are condemned is, quote, the source of spirituality, unquote. The Dutchman, Manier Pepperkorn, is the embodiment of the spirit of the magic mountain. As Levinas said, this enormous, orga this enormous organism, this gigantic body devoted to the senses and to enjoyments, represents the purely spiritual power of the person as the Germans imagine it by linking it to the organic." Unquote. Can you deny that he puts us all in his pocket? For Hans Kastorp, 
who raises this question? Those the answer in advance, of course. The main character in the novel, the fight against Peppercorn is doomed to failure. Neither the French Latin civilization nor the Judeo Christian tradition has a means to defeat the power. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, as a means. I think I think you have to unshare here, Joel. I think you pressed uh -huh. something. Could that be? Uh, I don't know. Um, oh, uh, Milen, can you please? Uh, if you just go here to this green. Button. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. It's a so friend of mine, so she should. Uh, <laughs> Milen. Can you please uh, stop the sh share screen? Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Milen. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. So I just, <laughs> I just, uh, no so it's, uh, yeah, a bit, a bit, uh, uh, yeah, is what I said. Um, yeah. Uh, for Hans Castorp, the main character in the novel, the fight against Peppercorn is doomed to failure. Neither the French Latin civilization nor the Judeo Christian tradition has the means to defeat a power that is not based on, on intelligence or, or spirit, nor on physical strength, but on the body taken, as Thomas Mann wrote in his novel, quote, in a mystical sense that changes the physical element into a spiritual one, or vice versa. Unquote. Even Prussian military discipline could not master this power, or as Levinas put it, this demon that sleeps in the death of the German soul, unquote. The demon that Hitlerism is unleashing at the very moment Levinas is writing these lines. By analyzing the type of spirituality peculiar to German culture, Levinas showed how it prepared a favorable ground for the emergence and triumph of Hitlerism. That said, the racism inherent in Hitlerism makes it a fact without precedent in history. A year later, a number of arguments from the 1933 article can be found in reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism. The ideals that Levinas ascribed to French culture are extended this time to European civilization in general. This is the case for the dualism between mind and body. Similarly, the description of the philosophy of Hitlerism takes up certain aspects of German spirituality. Nevertheless, I will go no further in my comparison of reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism and the understanding of spirituality in French and German culture. It would be unacceptable to make Nazism a direct outcome of German spirituality that is incarnated in the works of Freud, Thomas Mann, and so many others. Moreover, in reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, it is no longer an issue of simple, simple differences between French and German cultures, but of a clash between European ideals and the Nazi worldview. By overemphasizing the continuity between the two anal analyses, written a year apart, might make us miss Levinas' purpose, which gives the 1934 article its full importance. Characterizing what con constitutes the radical newness, the uniqueness of the Nazi philosophy, meaning a conception of man, society, and even truth, which makes it an unprecedented event in history. As Levinas made clear, the key issue is the very 
humanity of man, the essence of man, the foundation, biological and racial or spiritual and egalitarian upon which his personal identity is based. These are the stakes in the conflict opposing Europe to Hitler. Also, they have to do with classic philosophical questions. Levinas's reflections have nothing theoretical about them. Defining what it means to be oneself comes down to making a pronouncement as to what gives the individual his quality as a person, his being part or not being part of humanity. In this framework, the dualism characteristic of European civilization takes on its full meaning. To affirm the primacy of the spirit is to proclaim the possibility of eluding all forms of determinism, of taking one's distance with regard to reality and history. It makes freedom the very essence of man, the principle from which all his works derive, from the emergence of a culture to the search for truth. On the contrary, making the body the heart of spiritual life and the basis of human identity is not only a reaction to the excesses of dualism, it dooms man to a kind of bondage. In Levinas's view, the history of Europe is a process of liberation that has a purely spiritual nature. It concerns soul, spirit, or reason. The struggle for reason for aimed at delivering the human spirit, quote, from the domination of time, the past, and history, unquote. For Levinas, Judaism, Christianity, liberalism and Marxism all incarnated the, Europe, the European ideal of freedom. To illustrate the freedom promoted by Judaism, Levinas described, most likely drawing on Maimonides, the different aspect of Teshuvah, the act of return, a much bit better translation than repentance which has a central role in the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. He looked in particular at the spiritual significance of this act more than at its religious implications. Its three features, remorse, repentance, and forgiveness are the stages in the process of liberation of the human soul. The return, the deshuvah, designates the soul's reflection on itself and back on its past. It is a liberation from the alienation of the past and the possibility of starting all over again. And in this respect, Christianity, like Judaism from which it derives, has promoted a similar ideal of freedom that allows to start all over again. Liberalism, meaning the philosophy of the Enlightenment, exalted the power of reason. Although Marxism conceived of man as a product of economic and historical determinism, it assures him of a freedom which, somewhat like Spinoza, consists in the power to understand its laws. In total opposition to the European notion of man, Hitlerism transformed the bond between spirit and body into a chaining. As Levinas said, man is riveted to his body. Hitlerism made the core body the core of spiritual life. This magnification of the body and its vital forces is the foundation of the new conception of man. It is a principle on which is constructed a society, quote, based on consanguinity, unquote, and a conception of truth defined not as, quote, the dissemination of an idea, but as the expansion of might, unquote. As Levinas so lucidly stated at the end of his article, War, 
conquest and annihilation of the humanity in man are the logically consequences of the philosophy of Hitlerism. I now move on to Levinas's writings against Nazi antisemitism and neo-paganism. In 1935, a year after reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, Levinas published the first of his article, which would continue to appear until 1939 in Paix et Droit, the journal of Alliance Israelite Universelle. Once again, there is a recurrence in these articles of terms taken from the semantic field of spirituality. Levinas's goal is to evaluate, quote, the reverberations of the Nazi ordeal into the, the innermost reaches of the Jewish soul, unquote. At that hour, when Jewish consciousness was experiencing the most horrific crisis in its history, he felt it was imperative to discern what could secure it. The struggle against Nazism thus remained in the forefront in this text with dates of, of publication from 1935 to 1939 follow the dramatic sequence of events from the Nuremberg laws to the eve of the Second World War. World War. By showing that Sorry, by showing that racism is at the foundation of the philosophy of Hitlerism, Levinas forged as early as 1934 the instruments that enabled him to identify a year later the singularity of Nazi anti-Semitism. It is its racial character that makes it an unprecedented phenomenon and that radically distinguishes him from all the forms that hatred of the Jews had taken in history. Also, it may, have, it may have fed on it. It breaks with the traditional anti-Judaism of the church. As soon as it, it, it is based on race and what Levinas called the dark forces of blood, anti-Semitism excludes, excludes the escape route that conversion to Christianity was for so many assimilated Jews in Germany and France and in other places. This is what Levinas pointed out, quote, the affront in its racist form adds to the, hum to the humiliation, a poignant flavor of despair. The pathetic fate of being a Jew becomes a fatality. It can no longer be escaped. The Jew is inescapably reverted to his Judaism. And again, quote, in the symbol of the race, Hitler reminded us that one does not desert Judaism, unquote. Another theme is at the core of Levinas's insights, the clash between what, is, what he called Judeo-Christian civilization, unquote, and Hitlerism, the merciless struggle between paganism and anti-paganism. Anti Levinas did not reduce this struggle to a fight between monotheism and polytheism. For him, the distinction between paganism and Judaism is situated elsewhere. It is not formulated in theological terms. As Levinas humorously said, it is not a problem of arithmetic. The question is not whether there is one God or many gods. The distinction between paganism and Judaism is not dependent on the relationship to the divine, but rather to a certain relationship to the world. The pagan view is conceived of in terms of, quote, attachment, Installation, installation and foundation, unquote. The Jewish view is lived in terms of, quote, anxiety and insecurity, unquote. Contrary to the Nazi ideal of a truth that consists in the expansion of might, 
Levinas saw paganism as a type of impotence and incapacity. The pagan is radically incapable of exiting the world where he is, quote, directly on the level of things, but where he is also locked in. Levinas, unquote, Levinas pointed to another characteristic of the spirit that animates paganism. The pagan situates the spirits and God in the world, thus abolishing all transcendence. To Levinas, the pagan mode of existence, which consists of installing oneself and taking root in the world, is ancient. Aristotle himself may have given it a philosophical expression in his physics and cosmology. This pagan inspiration has been perpetuated through the history of the West, triumphing over a church and then a liberal society that was powerless to combat it. Hitlerian neo-paganism is, in a sense, the, res the resurgence of an attitude almost as old as the world itself. Thus, what is new is a type, type of paganism championed by Hitlerism. Levinas's response to this crucial question is the following. Racial antisemitism, hatred of Jews, elevated not only to a doctri doctrine, but to a, to a metaphysics, singularizes neo-paganism and differentiates it from previous forms of paganism. That is what emerged from spiritual essence of antisemitism, one of the last articles that Levinas published before the war. In this text, which dates to 1938, Levinas commented on remarks by Jacques Maritain, a Catholic thinker who published that same year a book entitled The Jews Among the Nations. Maritain presented a table country by country and with statistics of European antisemitism, not only, uh, only. <laughs> not only in Germany, but in Poland, in Romania, and in some other places. Like reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, his text, Maritain text, was an appeal to combat, as he said, racist, anti-Semitic, and anti-Christian Hitlerism. His analysis of racism and neo-paganism is quite similar to what Levinas had been saying since 1934. Maritain denounced what made Nazism, quote, the most inhuman and the most troubling mode of barbarism. It changed people to categories and to biological fatalities from which no use of their freedom can enable them to escape, unquote. It's almost like reading Levinas. Levinas agreed fully to the way in which Maritain viewed antisemitism by giving it a spiritual essence. Maritain refused to explain the hatred of Jews by purely economic, political, or cultural factors, by xenophobia or by the influx of immigrants. For both thinkers, this hatred had a metaphysical source. It is generated as Maritain said, quote, by the mission of Israel, by the passion of Jews for the absolute, by the fact that they are supernaturally estranged from the world, unquote. Commenting on these statements, Levinas stated that Judaism is anti-paganism by excellence. It is the absolute negation of, quote, the revolt of nature against the supernatural of the aspiration of the world to its own apotheosis, its beatification in its nature, unquote. Racial persecutions, far from being pure coincidence, are hence the direct outcome of this metaphysical hatred of Jews, this antisemitism which is specific to Hitlerism. <clears throat> 
Levinas felt affinities with Maritain, whom he praised for his courage and his generosity. At the same time, he rejected the view of the Catholic philosopher who refers, who refers to, quote, the theological significance of the scattering of Israel, unquote, by giving it a purely earthly destiny. This attitude is characteristic of the stance Levinas would take with regard to Christianity throughout his lifetime. Proximity without compromise. His proximity to Marita did not prevent him from asserting that, quote, that, quote, this antagonism between Christianity and Judaism remains complete and cannot accept compromise, unquote. As he would state very cl clearly, quote, we pass by the cross, we do not go towards it, unquote. To conclude, I'd like to ask two questions. The first question is related to the role that the Shoah may have played in the major change that occurred in Levinas' thought after the war with the emergence of the otherness. The second one is about the current the relevance of the reflections on the philosophy Hitlerism in our time. After the war, Levinas' philosophy underwent a real reversal. He abandoned the philosophy of escape of the pre-war period, the conception of a solitary and free subject for the ethics of otherness that we know. The conception of a subject in relation with the other and infinitely responsible for her. Shoah was not the direct cause of this major evolution, which in fact occurred for the first time in 1940 in a talk Levinas gave at La Sorbonne just before he was mobilized in the French army, taken prisoner and sent to captivity for the duration of the war in a camp located in the, in the, in the heart of Nazi Germany. Nevertheless, if one cannot establish a cause and effect relationship between Shoah and the Essex that Levinas elaborated from the immediate post-war periods onwards, his Essex cannot be understood independently of the final solution, the memory of which is perceptible in his philosophical as well as in his Jewish Talmudic works. Talmudic readings and difficult freedom. The dedication that appears at the beginning of Otherwise and Being or Beyond Essence, Levinas' master book published in 1974 gives a striking example. Levinas mentions in Hebrew, the name of quote, the closest of the six millions murdered by the Nazis, unquote. Yechiel and Vora his parents, Dov and Aminadav, his young brothers, Shmuel and Malka, his father and mother-in-law. My second question concerns the relevance of Levinas' analysis of Hitlerism for us today. In 1935, Levinas addressed a crucial question to Maimonides, the famous 12th century Jewish philosopher. What is his current relevance? What is there in him for us? Today, this, questions, this question can be asked of the article I have described in my talk. This text dates back to a universe before the Shoah. Prophetic in one way, they may seem old fashioned to some. Today, stating that racism was at the root of Nazism can seem quite trivial. Thus, the real question is what this te text indeed hold for us. Let me, in closing, provide one response. Levinas was not content to equate Nazi hatred of the Jews with a particular form of racism. Rather, he attempted to reveal the absolute uniqueness of Hitlerian antisemitism. 
That is the interpretation that should be given to his search for a spiritual essence or a metaphysics of antisemitism, making a clear cut distinction between racism and antisemitism in the all easy only way of fighting attempts at banalization of the show. Thank you very much for your patience and for your attention. Thank you very much, Joel, for this fascinating talk. Thanks a million.